Hey everyone, I'm here with Yaron Brook, a noted objectivist philosopher. Uh, you may have seen the recording of a lecture of his I did and recorded on my alternate channel. And Yaron, thanks for joining me for an interview. Thanks, thanks for doing the interview and thanks for recording that lecture. Got a, got a lot of views. And yeah, that was great. my pleasure. It was very interesting. Uh, any, anything titled The Evils of Corbyn Socialism, <laughs> I'm, I'm interested. <laughs> so, uh, Good. so would you like to tell me um, kind of how you came into objectivism? What Sure, sure. I uh, I was living in Israel. I grew up in Israel, yeah. and like all Israelis, I think in the uh, in the sixties and seventies, I grew up with socialism. I mean, it was in our blood. It was it was uh, every song, every class lesson plan. It was all about, in a sense, collectivism, the tribalism, the kind of Jewish tribalism, and socialism. And those were very much tied together. Right. So I was a committed collectivist and a committed committed socialist uh, when I was growing up, and. Uh, I had a discussion with a friend of mine one day, a friend who I'd known for many years, and he started spouting these capitalist ideas. And I basically said to him, where are you getting this nonsense from, you know? And he handed me a copy, a worn out old copy of Atlas Shrugged, and he said, you gotta read this book. So I did, and I, I read it, it turned out I read it very slowly, because I wasn't buying it, right? This, this was all wrong. Right. Um, okay. And I would throw it against the wall, and I would argue with Ayn Rand, because it challenged everything I believed in. Right. Everything was turned upside down. And um, by the time I finished the book, I was convinced, and, and I've never turned back. So uh, when I finished that book, I was, uh, I was an individualist, I was a capitalist. You know, I, I obviously thought I knew more than I did. As, as most people who read Atlas Shrugged, and many of your viewers probably know this, you, you become very arrogant and, and obnoxious, uh, as many objectivists, young objectivists tend to be. But, uh, you know, I continued studying ideas, reading pretty much everything she wrote, and then reading all the subsidiary literature on capitalism, on mm -hmm. economics, uh, history, you, you got to learn a lot of history. So I've been, a, I'd say, a committed objectivist since I finished out with Shrug, but probably wasn't a knowledgeable objectivist until yeah. very many, many years later. Right, okay, and um, <clears throat> so what was it about Atlas Shrug that you found so challenging? I mean, like, can you go into detail about sure. how it World apart. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the fundamental issue is an issue of morality, and I think that's true. The cent to me, that's a centerpiece of objectivism, mm -hmm. and and really the core of what challenges you. I mean, what what is at the core of collectivism? The core of collectivism is a is a moral idea that your moral purpose in life is to serve other people. Mm -hmm. Sacrifice is noble, is good, is wonderful for other people. Self sacrifice uh, to be selfless is the ideal. And I believe that. I mean, I was just waiting for the grenade to fall down so I could jump on it to, to sacrifice my life for the sake of the cause, right? Of, yeah. You know, of, yeah. of, of the tribe. And I really had bought into that. And here comes Ayn Rand and asks a very simple question, which I kind of asked myself at some point and rejected. So the question was, is why? Hmm. Why is somebody else's happiness more important than yours? Why is somebody else's life more valuable than yours? Mm -hmm. Why? should you sacrifice, in a sense, think less of yourself for the sake of others who are suddenly more important than you? Mm. Why should you jump in the grenade? Why is your life less important than the people you're saving? Um, and I asked that question, and, and my answer was, well, it's the only option. I mean, you, you, otherwise I'd be selfish. Yeah. And selfishness means being a nasty person. I don't want to be a nasty person, mm. so obviously I have to sacrifice for others. <coughs> and what Rand presents is this alternative of, no, you can be selfish, you can be self-interested, but in a proper sense, and for her proper would mean rational sense, mm -hmm. in a sense of rationally thinking about what really is good for you, long term, for the whole of your life, not doing whatever you feel like doing, because emotions are not tools of cognition, emotions are not, uh, are not really ways in which <coughs> We know about the world to know what's good for us. Indeed, most of the time we get in trouble. Yeah, so really for the first time in my life, I was confronted with this idea that there was a rational way to live for yourself, which didn't mean being obnoxious, didn't mean sacrificing other people to you, it didn't mean exploitation, it meant really focusing on what's good for me, how do I live the best life that I can live uh, you know, for the rest of my life. I was always an atheist, so it was always about you've got one shot at this, you've got one life, so how do I rationally think about my life in a way that will maximize my flourishing, mm -hmm. my happiness at the end of the day, uh, in this life, in this world? And to me, that was a, a, a revolution and hard, because 
again, in Israel, when you grow up, you're trained. I mean, literally trained, I think, by the system mm -hmm. to think in very other ways in, in Jewish culture and really all, all the culture we have around us is a culture of <clears throat> self, you know, be selfless. Now, nobody means it, right? Yeah. Your mother, when she says be selfless, doesn't actually mean it because she wants you to succeed and she wants you to do what makes you happy mm -hmm. and all this stuff. But morally, they are conditioned as parents to say, you know, you've got to be selfless, you've got to think of others first, think of yourself last, all of this stuff. So to me, that was the most challenging, and I'd say that integrating that idea of self-interest into the idea of individualism, my life is mine, I don't know it to the state, I don't know it to the tribe, I don't know it to, to, the, to collective group of people, that probably took me the most time to integrate out of my system. So I would get teary-eyed when I'd see the Israeli flag go up. It, it probably took me years after I read out of Shrug to stop that, right? To, right. to not get teary-eyed because it, it represents <clears> something <throat> different for me now. And it, 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 so now I get teary eyed about when I, when I hear people, it, it, stories of individual success, mm -hmm. of individual achievement. Yeah. It, to me, that is the, is the central focus, not group achievement, not to try, not, not that I think groups are, groups are bad, it's living for the group, which I think is the problem. Uh, that's, that's very interesting that you make that distinction, actually, because that's a distinction that very few people make. Yes. Um, and I, I find it very interesting as well that um, objectivism advocates classical liberalism as an economic system. And from what you've described, it fits perfectly with Adam Smith's baker. You know, he, he serves you out of his own self-interest, and there's nothing immoral about that. There's nothing well, immoral. it's not clear that that's what Adam Smith really believes, right? So oh, if, really? you read, if, you read, if you read Theory of Moral Sentiments, mm -hmm. Adam Smith is very conventional when it comes to morality. So at the end of the day, true morality for Adam Smith is about sacrifice. It's about selflessness. So what he does is he does this, and I think, I actually think, uh, Adam Smith, in some ways, is responsible for undermining the economic system he presents really? in the Wealth of Nations because he presents the system that works, yeah. capitalism, freedom, for the most part. He compromises here and there, but for the most part. But he presents a moral system that's antagonistic to capitalism, and he knows it. So what he says in the Wealth of Nations is, yeah, what the bank is doing is not noble. It's okay, but it's not noble. And what all these participants in the marketplace are doing is not noble, it's not moral, it's not good, because good is never self-interest. But when you aggregate it all up, it turns out that it's good for society. And that's the standard. The standard is still what's good for society. And since it's good for society, then we're willing to forgive them their vices. Well, well I, didn't, I didn't mean to, I, I wasn't <laughs> speaking to Adam Smith's personal yeah. pre preference to morality. Yeah. What I meant is, um, it's, it seems to be a moral system that underpins what he was presenting. Yes. Whether he realized it or not. Yeah. Well, yes, but he actually talks about it, which makes it interesting. Right. And again, I think by saying, when you add up a lot of vices, you get a virtue. People go, socialists go, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. I, I, I behave immorally and somehow the invisible hand makes it go away and good things happen. Yeah. So, so I, I think this is why it's been so difficult to defend capitalism. And I think Ayn Rand is, is the first thinker, really is the first thinker, to basically say, no, Adam Smith, you're wrong. The baker is virtuous for trying to take care of his own life and take care of his family. The baker is virtuous in trying to focus on, on the profit that he makes and trying to make maybe it would be even more virtuous if he was focused on making the best bread possible. Mm -hmm. That the baker, by being productive, by engaging his mind in a productive activity, by taking care of himself and the people he loves, by living a good life, that is the essence of virtue, and that is the essence of nobility. So it's not an accumulation of vices that creates this good, it's an accumulation of virtue that creates this good. Yeah. And now she's grounding capitalism on a moral foundation. She's mm -hmm. saying, so she's saying, if you want to have capitalism, it's not enough to have the economic knowledge. And indeed, if you keep the moral knowledge in the moral system that we have, we're never gonna have capitalism, mm -hmm. because you're undercutting yourself. What you need, the real revolution in a sense, the real upheaval in terms of the way people think about the world is in morality. What we need is to replace the altruistic system of morality. And again, altruism, it, it does not mean just being nice to people. No. Altruism means what Augustine Comte, who coined the term, meant it. It means living for the sake of others. Yeah. We need to replace that with the idea of living for one's own sake, but not in the conventional <clears> way, <throat> not the, the way the dictionary defines selfishness as taking care of self, by exploiting other people. Yeah. Why have that, you know, after the comma? Why not just say, take care of yourself? If, if that's, if people actually held that moral belief, mm. capitalism is, is, is obvious because 
people who want to live the best life that they can live and, 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 and live a, a flourishing life want to be free. Yeah. And all capitalism really is, is freedom taken seriously. It's freedom in every realm of our lives, not just in the, you know, it's interesting that the left wants some fr freedom in our social side, but, but they want to control everything economically. They're economic totalitarians. Yes. And they, I, like people, people like are often baffled when I say the left is inherently totalitarian. Yes. Even if they're advocating for social freedoms, you know, no, you can't do anything without money. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just the way the world works. And oh, if, but yeah. you can just print it. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. That's this how is what works. so yeah. many of these yeah. mythologies. Yeah. Are. But, but yeah, Ayn Rand used to be frustrated by left and right. She used to say, "Look, the left." Is is quite willing to be to be, to give us freedom in the bedroom, mm -hmm. but it's totalitarian in the boardroom, yeah. and the right it wants to give us freedom in the boardroom and it's totalitarian in the bedroom, yeah. and what she wants and what objectivism holds is liberty, is freedom, in the whole range of human life. So as long as you're not using force against another person, mm -hmm. as not as long as you're not violating somebody else's <coughs> rights. The state has no business in your life. Hmm. And I think that there's, I mean, there, there are obviously counter arguments that people will make, but they will be based on the altruistic set of ethics yes. rather than the self interested set of ethics. Or on some kind of utilitarian uh, yeah. argument. And, and Rand rejects all those arguments as moral arguments and says, no, that what's essential is the individual, his life, hmm. his values, and, and, and to, for the individual to pursue his values. Hmm. He must be free to use his reason, and the only thing that constrains reason, that can, that can, uh, you know, constrains our ability to live by our own thinking, is force. And therefore, what you need to eradicate from human life on every level is compulsion, coercion, authority, force. Mm -hmm. And and uh, once you do that, and that's the role of government is to become the monopoly over the use of force, but only use that force in retaliation. Once you do that, we are all free to make arrangements any way we see fit, based on our thinking. And sometimes we'll be wrong. Sometimes we'll make mistakes. Yeah. Sometimes, <clears throat> and then it's up to us <clears throat> to learn from those and to overcome them. Well, this is this is why we need a state that can enforce laws and have you know courts yes. and police. Unfortunately, yes. you know it's a sad fact of life that human beings aren't perfect. They all they're always going to be necessary if human beings want to live together, which they do. Exactly, so. government is a necessary good. Not, I mean, I know and all my anarchist friends yeah. uh, hate, or, or, or not so friends sometimes, uh, <laughs> hate the idea of, of government. But government is necessary, yeah. otherwise we really do fall into a state of constant violence, constant fighting. Yeah. Every disagreement lands up in me pulling out a gun and you pulling out a gun, or our, poli our respective private police forces pulling out guns. <laughs> and so you need the rule of law. Yeah. You need some standard, but that's the only job of government is, is to set that mm. and then leave us alone. And then we voluntarily can come up with all kinds. I always say, I always say even to my socialist, uh, I won't call them friends, to socialists, I say, you want to be a communist? Then you should be for a capitalist government. Because under ca capitalism, you can be a socialist. You can go and start a commune yeah. and you can have a group of friends together yeah. and you can give to each according to his needs, yeah. from each according to his ability, and you can live <clears throat> miserable, pathetic lives <laughs> any way you want. And nobody will interfere as long as you're not coercing anybody to join you in a little commune. Mm -hmm. But you can establish communes, you can establish a, a communal, whatever you want, as long as you're not coercing, coercing. That's the beauty of capitalism. You can experiment, you can try things, and if they don't work, you suffer the consequences, but, but, but you also get to learn from it. You know, it's very interesting because I've recently been uh, deeply diving into anarcho-communism, which really <laughs> should just be called communism yeah. because that was ideally the end state was to yes, end the state. Yes. Um, but it, it's very interesting how the, there's this underlying belief that it's it's simply more productive to have collective ownership. And it's, it's like, well, okay, you can keep asserting it, but the facts don't represent it. And Marx recognizes this in the Communist Manifesto. Oh, yeah. He, you know, he, he calls he calls the the expansion of the bourgeoisie. Um, he he remarks something like, "Who knew such productive forces slumbered in the lap of social labor?" It's like yeah. it's not social labor; yeah. it's private labor. Yeah, yeah. you liar. Yeah. You know? And and you see, Marx is a materialist, mm. so so all he sees is labor, yes. labor in the sense of physical physical activity. What he should really be saying is, "Who knew that that such uh, you know this slumbered in the in the minds of men?" Because real production comes out of the human mind. It doesn't come from muscle. And that's something Marxists have no appreciation for. Mm -hmm. and, and while we are somewhat, you know, you could argue that we are somewhat uh, equal in our ability to pull levers and to do uh, physical labor, 
we are clearly not equal when it comes to, to, to mental activity. Steve Jobs is oh, yeah. far smarter than I am, particularly when it comes to, 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 to devising yeah. you know, new gadgets. And so the inequality that happens is a complete result of the fact that just our, our ability to imagine, our ability to, to create, our ability to think through problems is vastly different. And, and that's just a, a st an existential state. Now what Marx wants us is in a sense, he wants to change human nature. Mm -hmm. And, and, and of course that's why they have to be genocidal because they, they have to assume that there's certain people who can change mm -hmm. and, and they've experienced capitalism and they're post-capitalist and now they're into this, you know, they've changed and they've evolved into this Marxist utopia. And then there's some people who either haven't experienced capitalism yet or just as Engels would put it, right, they just genetically are incapable of being good socialists. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and because it's an internationalist idea, it's not a state idea, mm -hmm. you have to wipe them out, you have to get rid of them because they're an incumbent on, on this wonderful socialist utopia. And it's why communism is, is genocidal well before uh, Nazism became genocidal, the, the, the socialists were already exterminate, trying to exterminate certain races. And that, that's not the only genocidal aspect to it. Like, like we were saying just before we set up, I mean, they, they want to genocide a class of people. Yes. They, they, I mean, and this is, I mean, you, you don't choose your class. Yes. Otherwise, everyone would choose to become upper class. Yes. Like race, class is something you were born into, you had no control over, and there's no reason why you should just be genocided on that basis. It, but, and it drives me crazy when people say, oh, the, at least the communists didn't want to wipe anyone out. Oh. Yes, they do. Then how did how did about two hundred? Well, I don't know the exact number, but somewhere between one hundred to two hundred million people get murdered yeah. just by accident. Yeah, you know, it's clearly Stalin wanted to wipe out the Ukrainians, mm -hmm. so he he orchestrated yep. a famine in Ukraine and let them starve. Clearly, Mao Zedong wanted wanted to, to, to eradicate sixteen million people. Chinese died of starvation, yeah. partially because the economic system inherently leads to starvation mm -hmm. because they don't produce. It's the mo It's the least productive system in human history, yep. uh, as 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 the Chinese farms, communal farms, were, were clear <laughs> proof of. You know, I don't know. You know the story how Chinese farming became privatized. Um, I, I it's, it's, it's a great know. story. So this is in the late seventies. Mao had died already. Yeah. And this little village in the center of China, far away from anything, they were starving, and and they, they weren't producing. Imagine my surprise. <laughs> and, and 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 they were they were they were being attacked by the central committee because they yeah. wouldn't be needing their quotas. Right? And they said, look, we're desperate. We, we got to try something. So they, they did a town council in secret. They didn't invite the communist commissar. Mm -hmm. And they said, why don't we do this? You, you, this is your piece of land. And, and this piece of land will be my piece of land. And anything you do there, you get the surplus you can keep. And, and we'll just try this experiment. And uh, it's not really, our, you know, they, they weren't actually creating private property. They are creating a pseudo private property because yeah. the states still owned it all. Yeah. And the next year, they were far exceeding, exceeding their, their quotas. And what happened was that, that they, people in the Central Committee noticed this, and they said, well, you know, what's going on there? They never used to be like this, so they sent people to investigate, and they were discovered. And the there, were people, there were people in the Communist Party who wanted to you know, wipe them out, basically, to, yeah. to teach a yeah. lesson. And luckily, the, the, the Deng Xiaoping, at the time, was, was the premier, he basically said no. He said, he was a complete pragmatist. Now he was an evil guy. He was responsible for Tiananmen Square, and he was responsible for a lot of deaths under, in the in the pre-cultural revolution. Uh, but but by this point, he had wised up enough to what works and what doesn't. And he said, "Look, communal farming obviously doesn't work. This works, and I don't know why this works because he didn't understand the theory. I don't know why this, but this works. Get another three villages and let's try it over there." And they did, and it worked there too. And he said, "Okay, let's let's basically." move to private farming. And the land is still owned by the state, but let's, let's do the pseudo private property yeah. thing where you have private farm, and that's how it happened. So in China, you got an example where a pragmatist like Deng, Deng Xiaoping, who was a communist, who believed in communism, but he was a pragmatist, saw that, ex that, that the Marxist theory is unproductive, it is destructive. And, and you see that in Israel with the kibbutzim, the, 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 the kibbutz, which is a, mm -hmm. a voluntary communal, it's like the most benign form of capitalism you can imagine. It was incredibly unproductive, subsidized by the Israeli government throughout all its history. Before that, it was subsidized by rich European, European Jews. It never stood in its own feet. It was never sustainable. Since the government has reduced its subsidies, mm -hmm. the kibbutz has completely fallen apart. It's become privatized. It's basically a village now. Right. Uh, so communism is anti-human nature. And wh what I like about objectivism, is that objectivism is about human nature. Hmm. 
And subjectivism takes, in a sense, it asks the question, what is a human being? What is the essential characteristic of a human being? Mm -hmm. And here she basically follows Aristotle in saying the essential characteristic of a human being is of, of a reasoning thinking being. Mm -hmm. So Aristotle called man the, the, rational, be, the rational animal. Oh, yeah. So we're a rational animal. Okay, so what does that imply? And ultimately what that implies is freedom. Because for the human mind to work effectively, it needs to be free. And so, so she would say, I'm for capitalism because I'm for rational egoism. And I'm for rational egoism because I'm for reason. At the end of the day, the core of, of my philosophy is man as a reasoning, reasoning being. That, that all, concept, all knowledge comes from reason, from, from our senses, from our capacity to, to think, to integrate, to, to observe. And if, if you start on that foundation, I think that if you honestly build it up, then then capitalism is is kind of obvious at the end of the day. I, I think um, I think the the problem most people have when arguing with capitalism is they they argue from like a the, the consequences, and it's easy to do that because I mean obviously, um, but that that's not really addressing the core failings of the communist argument because the, like I was reading the Conquest of Bread by Kropotkin. And it's a joke, yeah. but it's yeah. but I was recommended this so many times by communists that I was like, well, there must be something yeah. to this. Yeah. It's an absolute joke. He he seems to think that mankind, like the just the fact that they'll be working for the people, is enough incentive to make someone sit in a factory for five six hours a day. And it's not because factory work isn't fun. No, you know, labor isn't fun. It's not fun. Absolutely, it's, but it's but, but even when work is fun, <clears throat> why would you do it for the sake of other people? It, it, it's just that whole idea of that kind of motivation mm. is, is not human nature, it's not right. But you see, I, I believe communism is successful and was successful because <coughs> a, it is a direct outgrowth from Christianity. It's a direct outgrowth of the sacrificial vision of, of Christianity. Think about, mm. think about the essential thing in Christianity is Jesus on a cross, dying for sins he didn't commit, dying for your yeah, sins yeah, and my sins. Yeah. He and he is the what what Jordan Peterson calls the superhero. Yeah. He is the superhero. Yeah. So superheroes die for other people's sins. So we mere heroic people are willing to give everything for other people. No, why? Why should I live for somebody else? Right? Again, it goes back to that fundamental question. But Christianity teaches us that sacrifice and selflessness of the ideal, that dying in a sense for other people is the ideal, and communism just says. Yeah, there's no God, but everything else Christianity taught you is correct. And this is why it worked so well in Russia. Because Russia has always been a very mystical, mm -hmm. very Christian, very uh, a culture, a Christian Orthodox culture, but still Christian. So all the communists did was replace God with the proletarian mm -hmm. and came to the Russian people and said, everything you do is fine, in a sense. You, I mean, remember, Russia was never communist, a capitalist, right? Nice. And so everything, all, all this agrarian, you're working for the for, for what we want you to work for now instead of for God, we want you to work for the politician. And they replaced it and they created a mystical system, mm -hmm. same mysticism, yeah. where the reason it's okay to be Lenin or Stalin is because somebody has to know what the proletarian need, mm -hmm. right? Somebody has to dictate, plus we're not perfect yet, we're not completely, we don't have the collective consciousness yet. Well, it's, it's a stage on the process to establishing real communism. It's Absolutely. It's a dictatorship of the proletarian. Yes, and, yeah. and, and, but it's a dictatorship of the proletarian, yet yeah. it's not a dictatorship of the proletarian, it's a dictatorship of Lenin or Stalin. But you need Lenin or Stalin, because the fact is that somebody has to commune with the proletarian to know what's good for them. And, and this is Hitler, right? Hitler had to, you had to have a Hitler to commune with the spirit of the Aryan people. Yeah. Who knows what the Aryan wants, except unless you have a Hitler. And really this goes back to Plato, to link this up philosophically, to the idea of a philosopher king. The whole idea of Plato's philosophy is that real knowledge, the truth, is unknowable to, most, to, to all of us, right? Yeah. To, the common person is living in a cave he sees shadows. Yeah, this is yeah. his cave. Uh, cave <clears throat> mm -hmm. And that the philosopher king actually sees the sun, he sees the truth. Yeah. The world of forms. So when, when we see a chairs and carpets and everything, that's not real reality. Mm -hmm. The real reality is in a different dimension. And then you need somebody who can not reason his way to that other dimension, but through some form of revelation, yeah. get that knowledge. And then, com then communicate to all of us. And that's why in the Republic, you're ruled by philosopher kings because they're the only ones who have real knowledge. Now, all Hitler, Lenin, Stalin are, are, are in a sense, fill-ins 
for the philosopher king. Now think about Christianity as well. What's a pope? A pope communes with the world. It forms God. Yep. And he tells us what's the truth. So as long as Plato rules, and I think Plato very much rules the world we live in, yep. we, we tend towards authoritarian models. We tend towards collectivism. We, 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 we undercut the argument for reason. The beauty of Aristotle, his, Plato's nemesis ultimately, historically, is that Aristotle says, no, each one of us has the capacity to reason. Each one of us has the capacity to know reality as it is. Yeah. And therefore, each one of us can be our own master. <coughs> we can guide our own life. We don't need philosopher kings to tell us how to live. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can know reality, and, and therefore, we know what's good for us. We know what kind of government we want. We can, therefore, elect a government. So it's the rebirth of Aristotelianism, in, particularly in the Enlightenment. Which is which gives us kind of the the, the capitalist the free the sort of self confidence. Yes, that's the that's the thing that I think yes. has really been lacking recently, and it, I find it really bizarre as well because with with the advent of the internet, my God, if if you think you can make something happen, then you have every tool you will ever need, literally at the the end of your fingertips. Absolutely, but think about the heirs of Plato. Mm. The heirs of Plato, in my mind, I today are the post, are the post, -con uh, the post Kantians, yeah. ultimately the postmodernists. Mm -hmm. And the, what are the postmodernists teaching our kids at every university, pretty much? Dependence. In all? Reality doesn't exist. Yeah. Your mind is impotent and futile. Mm -hmm. So why even try? The only, the only comfort you can get is by joining your little racial or ethnic group. Yeah, whatever. So, so whatever the group happens to be. But you somehow, when we're in a group, we have knowledge. How are we going to get that knowledge? Well, we're not. So we're going to just have to go to our philosopher king, the professor, or whatever, and he's going to give it to us. And it's not in this world because, again, this world doesn't exist. They t so it, what we're seeing is a recycling over and over again throughout history mm. of Plato's ideas in different guises. And they are destructive to exactly individual confidence because if you lose confidence in your mind, if you're told that reason is impotent, you're dead. You're, you're finished. Right? And, and that's, that's the key, the rediscovery of reason, the rediscovery of Aristotle. The, 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 and, and, and until we have Aristotle, in a sense, anchored in our humanities, mm -hmm. and until we reject the postmodernism and, and everything really since Kant, and, and I know you've, you've, uh, you've kind of uh, read Dominus Parallels. So I you, have. You, I've, I've read Kant. Yeah, I've and read, you've read uh, Kant. So yeah, I've read a lot, to be honest. Yeah, and, 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 <laughs> and it all changed from Kant to Hegel to Schopenhauer to Marx to, to ultimately to Nietzsche to Heidegger and to the, to the Foucaults and all the ridiculous postmodernists. Yeah. It's Thanks, all Charles. one chain. Yeah, and it's all one chain. In, it, it's a, just, just variations. Of, uh, on, on Plato's spin and what Kant does is he modernizes <coughs> Plato and he makes him seem more sophisticated mm -hmm. but it's still the same stuff and, and until we reject that we're stuck. I tell you, the, the curse of central planning really is the, it's the bane of human success in my opinion yes. because I, I really think that Hayek had a point when he was like look this is it's a, it's a system so complex there's no point trying to manage it centrally Yes. You know, let, it, like, have some faith in humans, uh, people's ability to judge for themselves. But it's it, it's more than that. It's there's something uh, there's something, you know, in a sense that Hayek is missing here because hmm. the fundamental here is that only only I can know in the details what's good <clears> for me. <throat> yeah. Only I can know because, you know, only I can reach what it truly values for me. Only I know what my passions are, what my interests yeah. are, what, 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 you know, only I can think for me. Nobody else can do my thinking for me. Every central planner basically is saying, mm. I know better what's good for you yeah. than you do. Yeah. And that's just impossible. That, can't, that is not possible. It's not an issue of the central planner not being smart enough <clears throat> or not having enough data because we are not, in my view, we're not deterministic beings. So, so you can't you can't run an algorithm on my mind. You can't just, it, it's not just n numbers. It, you know, we have free will, we have choices, we make choices, and no central planet can mimic that. And, and those choices, as Hayek describes, get priced into the price system. We, we provide signals to the market. And as a consequence of that, you get the beauty, and I really believe it's beautiful, of a marketplace where, where people are buying and selling based on their values mm -hmm. in win-win transactions where nobody's yeah. losing. Well, that, that's something that I've been trying to explain to the communists as well because like the, 
the, I, I really think that the, the lack of incentive is in the abstraction of the goal. Where they say, well, this is for the people, this is for the proletariat, this is for the nation, this is... I mean, it's so airy. Yes. You know, it's like, but yes. if you say, look, if you do eight hours in a factory, then I'm going to give you this pile of cash, and then you can do with that cash what you want. That's a that's a very clear incentive. Yes. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I left university when I was 22, and I worked in factories. I hated it, but yeah. I did it because I needed the money, and yes. I knew what I was going to get out of the end of it. If, if someone had said to me, right, we need you to work in this factory for eight hours for the people, I would be like... I don't like the hell of the people. Well, absolutely. So, absolutely. It's not fun work. I don't enjoy it. I'm not going to do it. And again, it. why should I work for the people? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Why, should, why are the people more important than me? And this yeah. is the fundamental question in morality that we have to ask. Mm -hmm. Why is the group more important than the individual? Isn't a group just a bunch of individuals? Yeah. And therefore, shouldn't the individual be focused on his own well-being? Put aside the empirical evidence that when people do work for themselves, yeah. that they do much better. Yeah. But morally, just from a purely abstract view, you have one shot at this life. Yeah. Why am I going to live it for you? I, I don't care that much about you, right? I mean, I, even if I even if I really like you, I'm not going to live my life for you. It, it's almost like a form of moral enslavement, isn't yes. it? It's, 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 it's literally like, why should I? You know, like, and w what claim to my moral servitude do you have? Exactly. Uh, that, I mean, that's a beautiful way of saying it. Moral, ser moral slavery. Well, I like I, I've been thinking about this a lot because I... I I think if I was going to describe myself as anything, it'd probably be as a moralist because I, 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 I spent all my time in my twenties reading Greeks, basically, <laughs> and I, I loved it. I loved yeah, it. I love and the um, and I, I've been thinking about the concept of like moral sovereignty. So I was thinking because I mean, if you if you don't believe in God, then where does morality come from? And ultimately, it has to come from the individual who is preaching morality. They have to be the one who, if if they, it's not their own ideas, they still have to decide this is the best. Someone has to make that decision. Yes, but it, I don't think it's a decision. I, so I, I think morality comes from uh, from reality. So, so this sure. is a, this is the sequence, right? Sure. You know, morality is a code of values. Yeah. To guide one's life. Yes. You know, right or wrong. Yes. What are values? Things that we act to gain or keep. Yeah. So, you know, what? Why do we want to gain certain things and not other things? What's what's the what's the fundamental choice that we have in life? that dictates that we want some things and not other things. And, and I think the fun, because all, in a sense, you could say all living things have values. Sure. It, they don't choose them, but they have values. <coughs> well, but what is the thing that dictates those values? And the thing that dictates those values is ultimately the fundamental choice that we all have to live or not, hmm. to survive or not. Now, if you're not living, it doesn't, you know, you don't get to choose, but any living being from a plant to an animal to a human being has to take action. Yeah in order to secure its survival. Yes. So a plant has to seek out light. It has to seek, dig its roots down into the ground to seek out water. Mm -hmm. And that's true of human beings. Certain acts that we take will lead to life and certain acts that we take are gonna lead to death. So, that, so morality for me is about what are the choices? What are the values that lead to life? Life, the individual life has to be the standard. Once you eliminate God, so there is no external standard. Mm -hmm. The standard is my life. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what are the actions that I will take? What are the virtues that I should subscribe to that will lead to success in life? Mm -hmm. That's it. And, and, and for me, if you ask, okay, well, empirically, let's look around the world and say, what are the kind of actions that lead to life and what are the kind of actions that lead to death? What's the, what's the most fundamental act that we do that is, leads to our success? Mm -hmm. And I would say it's being rational. It's thinking. Every human value yeah. comes from thinking. Yeah. Everything from our food, somebody had invented, yeah. somebody had figured out. We're not, yeah. we're not genetically programmed to know how to do agriculture yeah. or, or, to or, even, to fire or, or even to hunt. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's true. All of that requires us building tools, yeah. strategies, uh, because we're too weak. Yeah, I mean, we as didn't a, have to train young boys in a tribe. No. Because, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're <clears throat> weak, pathetic animals yeah. if we're just physical as yeah, Marx would believe, right? Yeah, yeah. We'd, we'd have all died a long time ago. In the state ago. of nature, yeah. We change the environment to fit our needs and we use our reason to do that. So morality then becomes uh, really focused on being rational, mm -hmm. really focused on what are the rational activities, what are the rational things that I can do in pursuit of my life. Mm -hmm. And as part of my life, Rand, so Rand defines three kind of cardinal values. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, uh, uh, reason, mm -hmm. uh, purpose. Every human being, you know, again, empirically, you can, you need something to strive towards. You need a goal, so a purpose and self-esteem. You need to have the, the, in a sense, the confidence 
that you're worthy of living in this world, that you're worthy of existing and, and flourishing in, in, in the yeah. world as, you know. And you, you, your life as, you as an individual matter because you are a human. Yes. And we agree, humans matter. Yes, and you're alive. <clears throat> yeah. And, and, and then the question is, okay, what virtues, in a sense, actions, mm. do you take in order to achieve these values? And she comes up with seven. You know, you could argue they're eight, nine, or they're five, sure. or whatever. But, but the point is, it's in a sense Aristotle's project, right? Yeah. Aristotle's project was, what are the virtues that lead to a good life? Mm -hmm. And Rand basically says, here are the virtues I believe lead to a good life, lead to, you know, reason, purpose, and self-esteem. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and, and first among them is rationality. And so it's, it's, it's not that she says, you know, morality is whatever you think it is. It, she's not a subjectivist in that sense. She believes there's an objective set of, va uh, of values and virtues that mm -hmm. we all pursue. How we pursue them is going to be different. Sure. Somebody's going to be a doctor. Somebody's going to be a, a, a YouTube celebrity. Uh, you know, we're, we're all going to achieve our, let's say, our, the virtue of productivity differently. But we all need to be productive. And indeed, if we're not productive, <coughs> we're unhappy. <coughs> we lack self-esteem because we don't have the confidence that we're able to, to, to really, mm -hmm. in a sense, manipulate reality in order to live. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, 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 and if, so if people, to me, once you get the framework, it, it all starts making sense, and it's all very rational, and and uh, from what it leads from one point to another, it's very logical. I, I find it okay. So going with something you said earlier that I, that this just sticking in my head, which I yeah. found very interesting. Um, go, going back to Adam Smith, you know, the, the baker bakes bread out of his own self interest. Someone else buys the bread because in their self interest is they yep. need it. Yep. They they use money because that's the the unit of proof of value to society, I suppose you could No, use. no, it's, it's simply the medium of exchange. So when we try barter, it's just too inconvenient. Sure. Money was created to, to allow for convenience. It's sure, it, but the, like, like the, what I mean is the underlying principle includes barter as well. You, you have something that, yeah. that you worked to produce. And all and we do is barter. Yeah. yeah Money yeah. is a way to facilitate barter yeah. effectively. But it's, it, it's, not, it's not something that has less value than what you're exchanging. It's the, it's the, the value of the exchange as you both perceive it. Yes, but the only value money has is from the, your ability to exchange. A it. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, and it's the same barter. I mean, you know, if, yes. if I had a million loads of bread, my, sure. my loads of bread wouldn't have much no. value. You know, no. so no. It, it's it, but you know, so underlying it. But what I'm saying is, I you know, I'm showing that I'm not just taking from you, and that's what, like, like you say, it's a, it's an equal exchange. It's an exchange both agree on. Well, the beauty is, it's not equal. Well, I'm not saying you're it's not both profit. winning. No, yeah. no, you're both winning. So the baker makes a profit. Yeah. And the person who bought the bread gets something more important than the money he had. Yeah. He gets bread. Yeah. He wouldn't have given up the two dollars. Yeah. Maybe, okay. Equal is the wrong way. So they're both yeah. better off, uh, which is yeah. the beauty of it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's yeah. Uh, it's but it's serving both of their interests, yeah. and it's doing it fairly in yeah. a way that they've both agreed to and cooperated with. And I've never I've never heard anyone describe that as a moral thing. But and I'm I'm thinking about it. Maybe it's because I haven't spent a lot of time, you know, ruminating on it. Yeah. But like, I don't see how you could say it was anything other than a moral good for two people to agree to do something and then both do it, both be satisfied, and walk away with, you know, both happier. For unless it. there's some kind of deception, or unless there's some real irrationality, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. irrationality, or some sickness involved. <coughs> you know, I'm I'm not sure that every time we exchange, let's say I'm buying my gram of cocaine and I'm going to get high on the cocaine, <laughs> I would argue that, the, that me getting high on cocaine is immoral, not because of society, but because it's hurting me. Sure. Because long term, so the exchange is kind of... But putting aside that, if, if both parties are rational, absolutely, it's a, it, that is what, that's the essence of morality. The essence of morality is bettering oneself. Hmm. And, and the, the way in which we do that in a social setting, one of the ways in which we do it in a social setting, is by trading with one another. Trade is a way in which we better ourselves. Now, to trade, you have to first produce. Yeah. But, but once you produce, you, you, the beauty of a division of labor society, as Adam Smith describes it, is our ability to then trade to keep improving our world. And um, so, so yes, it's, a, it's an inherently, trade is an inherently moral activity. Right? That's interesting. It's an inherently moral activity because it's about bettering mm. your self-interest. See, and you see Adam Smith views it as, mm. as not so moral, but in the end, it makes everybody better off, so it's okay. Yeah, I, th I think he views it as amoral, yes. doesn't he? Well, it's not yes. good or bad, it's yes. just... And the motivation <clears throat> is suspect. Mm. Anytime self-interest steps in, it's at the, the very least it's suspect. Yeah, now that, that's something else, because what, what, I mean, like, what, what I was getting at is basically you can see why capitalism is so productive if you just look at the interest. Yes. Know? It's, you know, someone else's interest aligned with someone else's interest, 
they mesh together they both benefit yep. they it's it's you know and and suddenly and and they've both got the desire to do that again yes you know or, or with other people it's like and, and the communists just can't understand why capitalism is so productive it's like well, it's obvious if two people are getting their interests served without any loser in the equation absolutely of course that's going to be productive and and, and if i work harder or if i work smarter mm. i'm going to make more money yeah isn't that a motivation to work harder and to work smarter? Yeah. So to me, it's mind-boggling. And you know, and to some extent, I believed this when I was young. It's mind-boggling that you can hold this idea that no, what really drives people is the is 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 other people's well. No, nobody nobody actually in real life is motivated by the well-being of the people. I mean, yeah. maybe in extreme situations like when the grenade is thrown in, maybe in extreme situations sure. that's true. But in most day-to-day activities. Luckily for the human race, we are mostly self-interested. We are engaged in pursuing what's good for us. Yeah, that, that's another thing I want to get to. Because, like, okay, so one thing I hate seeing is, um, say, a white first world feminist, who's a female, get up and say, I'm fighting for women. And it's like, you are a woman. You're fighting for your own self-interest. You can claim to be fighting for someone else's self-interest, but at the end of the day, it is definitely your own self-interest as well. Yes. So don't lie to me and tell yes. me you're fighting for someone you can't even name. Just just to make you say, I want this. Yes. Then we're having an honest conversation. And I can say, well, I don't want you to have that. And I yeah. can tell you why, because you want to take something from me yes. you don't have the right to have, or whatever it is. You know. But then, then we're having an honest conversation. But until we can get into, and, and this is, this is I'm, I'm gonna write a thing about bourgeois morality, because I've, <laughs> I've started to really despise bourgeois morality. I'm not sure what bourgeois morality is. It's uh, well, kind of a... It, it's, it's a... It's a complex social yes, construct yes. that bears very little relation to reality, right? Now, or to I'm, morality, yes. Or, I think or, or, right. Yeah, morality, yeah. or reality. Yeah. But it's, it's very, like, you know when a terrorist attack happens, say in yeah. France, and then you get people in England putting French flags on their yes. profile pictures. Yes. You, you can go through their profile and you can see they don't know a single French person. No. Not one person in France has seen this. So why did they do this? Well, what offends me more <laughs> is when people after, for example, uh, Charlie Hebdo, mm-hmm. put up uh, Je suis Charlie Hebdo, right? Yeah. And, 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 but they wouldn't put up the cartoon. Yeah. So my view is, I'm all for being Charlie yeah. Hebdo, but then oh, show yeah. the cartoons. Oh yeah, right. Have big posters of the cartoons. Yeah. Wave flags of the cartoons. Yeah. Put it up on your Facebook profile. Yeah. Put it up on your on your website. Totally then you have the right to call yourself Yes We yeah. Charlie Hebdo. But if you're saying that, and then you're saying, but you know, they maybe went over a little bit too yeah, far, and we don't want to offend Muslims, and we don't want to do this. Yeah. Then you're yeah. you're not worthy of of being called Yes We. So that really drives me nuts. If if you say I am X live up to the X. Well, that's that's exactly what I'm saying about border morality, yeah. morality because what it is, it's a, it's a fiction. It's a yes. it's a pretension that they, you know, because like when, when no French person sees your French flag, why did you put it up? Yes. You put it up so your friends can see, so oh, guess, you care. I guess this is what they what people call <clears throat> virtue signaling. That's exactly yes. what it is. It's, yes. R- Rousseau actually, like, Marx has kind of like stolen the concept of the bourgeoisie from Rousseau. It's a real shame because Rousseau really defined it in like social terms. And I've been looking into this really deeply recently because there's something, I've found a thread and I know that if I keep pulling it, I'm one day going to be really offending the middle class, which is fine. I like offending the middle class. Well, again, (laughs) I mean, my view view is you got to be careful accepting Marx's terms or Rousseau's terms. There is no such thing as the middle class. There's me and you and, and individuals. And so I, I often say, I don't care about the poor, I don't care about the middle class, no. I don't care about the rich. What I care about is productive individuals, whether they have opportunities in life to advance their fullest potential. I, that's what I, and you know what, if you're, if you're, if you're a wife beating drunk poor person, I don't care about you. But if you're a wife beating drunk rich person, I don't care about you either. Yeah. It's not where you are in the socioeconomic whatever, it's, it's who are you as an individual? Are you a good person or a bad person? And this also relates to this anti-collectivism. I mean, why are we lumping people in to these tribes and these groups when they're completely different people? What I care about is virtue. What I care about is goodness, is good people and, and what they believe in and, and what kind of lives they live. Now, that's a really, oh, that's a great point to bring up, actually, because one, one thing that people, I, I am completely Aristotelian in this. I think virtue is done by action. Yes. So I, I don't even care what you really believe. If, or if, what you say? What, yeah, what you say? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. What, yeah. yeah, what you say? Because if you're not living up to, it, and this this is why I hate the bourgeois morality, because like with the, the example of the yep. French flags, okay, 
nothing's changed. Yep. You've you've helped not one person yep. in France. You've yep. not prevented another terrorist yep. attack. You've not you've not even you know you've not even made you know shown sympathy to someone. Yep. It's it's all fiction. It's all pretense. Through your action, you have done nothing, and you have no claim to be a better person than anyone else. Because really, what you're doing is kind of trying to grab on to someone else's yes. morality. You know, you're trying to you're trying to steal some of that glory. Yeah, I mean, you, you and, and this is right. I mean, I may often call this kind of the second hand of principle. It's the idea that that you're getting <clears throat> your values. You're getting you get from other people. Mm -hmm. So it's cool to post the French flag. So you put it up not because you believe in anything, not because it, it yeah. really represents your views in any substantial mm -hmm. way, but because that's the thing to do. Yeah. And it's completely second handed. You're getting it from your friends, your society, from what you think other people will value, and it's all about projecting to other people. Yeah. And 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 again, Rand is all about. What is really good for me? Yeah. Really good for me. And sometimes that'll be the same as what's other people. Sometimes it'll be completely different. Mm -hmm. And it's about being independent. And being independent is not being counter to other people. Because, you know, so like the, the hippies who, who uh, you know, who wear, you know, you wear torn jeans because everybody else wears ordinary jeans and everybody now wears torn jeans. But that's just being a collectivist, just in reverse. You're doing the opposite. No. What do I really want to wear? What do, what do I think I look good in? Or what, what do I think is... So being truly independent is really thinking through what is good for me, independent of what society thinks, independent of what my friends think, independent of what they'll think of me. Yeah. Now, now th this is great, actually, because this... this and I, I keep bringing back to the boards of morality, but yeah. I really think yeah. this is... It's, it's like a, a blob that sits on top of society, <laughs> right? And... Rousseau would have called you a savage, you know, because yes. he's saying because what you're describing there is living within yourself. Well, yes, right? but you see, his definition of living within yourself and my definition of living within yourself is completely different. Oh, okay. What's what's yours? Well, he would say his definition of living within yourself is basically pure emotion. It's 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 right, it's, okay. it's an emo. You know, you're running around nature naked. And having you know, and and, and, and and participating in in sexual activity because sure. you have an urge to do yeah. so, right? It's it's really <coughs> primitive, in a sense of man before. In some ways, it's man before he became self-conscious. It's man qua animal, and that's what Rousseau views as the ideal, and, and I think that's incredibly instructive. I think Rousseau is yeah. one of the bad guys in history. So, to me, it's 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 again reason. It's it's figuring out, it's using my own mind and my own rationality to figure out what a value. So, yeah. and, and at the end of the day, one of the reasons I, in a sense, I love the middle class and the bourgeois, if you will, is because these are people who've actually done that. They don't acknowledge it, they don't understand it, mm -hmm. but to be middle class means you've taken your life seriously to some extent. You've worked hard. You've made you've made a certain standard of living. Mm -hmm. You've uh, you, you've achieved something in mm -hmm. your life. Not not the level of uh, Steve Jobs in that, sure. but but something in yeah. your life. You've 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 applied yourself. And it, to me, it's tragic then mm -hmm. that they then get they they get get squished by this blob of secondhand of this collectivism Absolutely. and 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 just mm -hmm. self negation. What they're doing is really destroying mm -hmm. what it is that made them good in the first place. So. Uh, Totally agree. And th this is this is what I mean. By, <clears throat> like I wasn't I wasn't um, I wasn't trying to call. I know. Yeah, I know. Because I agree, Russo yeah. certainly has his problems. Yeah. But he had some great observations, and like I th I think the key is trying to get people to live within themselves to get say, look, it doesn't matter what that yes. person thinks of your shirt. It, yes. it just doesn't matter. Yes. You know, it, what do you think of your shirt? You know, yes, that, that and living within yourself. I think. And is what do you think? Back. Yeah, think yeah. Yeah, is, is the think? key yeah. and 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 I think one of the problems we have as a society mm. is we've we've become and this is particularly true of kids on campuses today oh, yeah. we've become enamored by emotions oh, yeah. so while I love emotions I mean I'm a passionate guy and and and, and, uh, and, and you experience life through your emotions sure. and ideally your emotions are integrated with your thinking so that they're consistent uh, but sometimes they deviate and the question is what's important mm. and what's important is cognition What's important is thinking, because ultimately emotions are consequences of past thinking, and sometimes of mistaken thinking. So, for example, right, you fall in love with somebody based on, I think, shared values and shared whatever. Then you learn new facts about the person. Mm -hmm. What happens? Your emotions change. Yeah. So your emotions change because you've integrated those thinking and said, oh, they're not the kind of person I thought they were. Sometimes, often actually, what happens is your emotions actually lag your thinking. 
So you have come to the conclusion, this person's not as good as I thought. Yeah, yeah. But it's hard to get away because you're, you're still, still emotionally connected. Yeah. But the emotions ultimately will catch up with you. So emotions are <coughs> consequence of thinking, good or bad, because they're consequence of subconscious integrations. And it, we get enamored by our emotions. But and young people today in schools mm. are trained to emote. Yeah. They're trained to feel. When you put six-year-olds down and you ask them what they think of transgender people, they don't know what sex is. They don't know what gender is. They don't know what life is. They don't know anything about anything, right? Six-year-olds, so all they can do is emote based on stuff that they've heard, and, you're, you're, and you're, you're validating that. You're validating the idea that what's really valuable. Now, put aside transgender. Ask them what they think about politics, what they think about anything. They just don't know. The whole purpose of being six is to learn. You know, until you're about 13, 14, 15, you're not capable, your frontal cortex is not developed enough to actually think about anything. You don't have enough knowledge of the world anyway. No. You can't make an informed decision. So what we're, doing to, <laughs> what we're doing today with these kids is we're letting them do whatever the hell they want, mm. which means whatever their emotions dictate, and we're saying their emotions are valid and, and, and whatever the emotion is, and we're, we're celebrating emotionalism. So when these kids get to college and somebody says something offensive to them and they get offended, then I can understand them going, this is the end of my world. You can't do this because yeah. that's what they've been trained to do instead of what education should be about. It's training the mind, yeah. training us to think, T training us to think, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, really think through problems. This is why every kid should learn math. You know, kids say, well, what do I need calculus? I'll never use it in life. You'll use it in the sense that calculus teaches you how to be a disciplined thinker. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the actual activity of calculus you'll never do in your life, but it's training you to do something really, really, really important. But, but we now denigrate all that. We, we, we don't think any of that is important. Critical thinking is what school is for. And well, it, it should be what yes, school is for. Yes. That's, I think now we're socializing thing. kids. Yeah. It, it's about socialization and emotional training. And then colleges now become a catering to that. Yes. So now when they go to college, they don't learn to think either. Yep. So we're getting young adults who've never been actually trained to think, and we call you know they're being called snowflakes, because because it's an they expression are. of their emotion. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's really interesting as well. Like um, <clears throat> I I can never understand. Like for, for I I really enjoy stoicism. I really enjoyed doing it. I mean, like, a lot of the time, it went too far, you yeah, know, yeah. you're there being tortured yeah. and you're meant to take responsibility yeah. for being tortured. It's, yeah. you know, it goes too far sometimes. Yes. But I, I like the underlying principle. It's like, wherever possible, you take responsibility for what Absolutely. happens to you because then you will know, you know, you, you know why that happened, you know what decisions you made, and you are the one who has to deal with it. And it makes you stronger. It makes you tough. It makes you, it, it makes you unable to be offended, you know, and... It seems to be inculcating weakness. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if somebody says something to me, a communist says something yeah. to me about communism or whatever, I mean, there are really two options. They're either right or they're wrong. Sure. Right? If they're right... Let's assume they're wrong. Well, let's start with they're right, right? Let's assume it wasn't a communist. Let's assume it's somebody. Right? And they come to me and they say, you're wrong, you're wrong about this. This is what it's really like. And if it turns out they're right, I should thank them. Yes. Right? If they're wrong, why should I care? It's their problem that they're wrong, not my problem that they're wrong. So I don't get offended by people, even you know, people calling me names and everything else, because they're wrong. It's their problem. Yep. Their lives are screwed up because they're wrong. I believe that if you're right, it enhances life. So it's not relevant to me mm. either way, right? So a whole attitude towards knowledge is, if somebody says something that's, that's critical of what I'm saying, but he's right, Cool. Mm. I just learned something new. How yeah. cool is that? And if it's wrong, it's their problem. Again, it's about, as you said, it's about taking responsibility for yourself. Mm -hmm. You're not responsible for other people's thinking. Okay. So if somebody else is wrong, it's not my responsibility. I'm not going to be offended by it. And 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 learning from your mistakes, uh, and and that makes you a better person. It makes you a better thinker. Therefore, better human being, uh, more capable of living. Yeah, and and and. I mean, it, it becomes a charitable act to go to someone and say, look, I think there's a deficiency in your thinking. Yes, I think absolutely. I can correct you. I, I'm happy to take the time because I think this will help you. Yes. That's a charitable act. You, you know, what do you actually gain from that? I mean, I suppose... Well, well I, I'm a teacher, so I gain a huge amount from well, yeah. it because I love doing it, right? Yeah. So I, what I gain, personally enjoy What it. I gain is, is, the, is the light coming on in somebody's eyes yeah. when they discover somebody something true that I've just said or, or, the, or that they make the integration. So, so teaching is, is an incredibly selfish 
activity. I love it. Really? Right? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, because you get real joy and yeah. plus you, you, you're communicating knowledge to people yeah. and you're helping them become better people, which helps you mm -hmm. because then they're making the world a better place. Mm -hmm. So f for you and your children and the people you love. So uh, absolutely, teaching is a, is, I mean, all professions done right are selfish sure. activities yeah. uh, because otherwise, why go into them, yeah. right? I mean, I, again, going back to that, like, I think self-interest, this is, this is what drives me crazy about um, collectivist ideologies in general because they are based on a, a moral ethic of altruism and I don't like the idea that I'm being told that, I mean, like, everyone operates in their own self-interest all the time whether they realize it or not. So I don't believe that. Really? Yes, I okay, don't believe that. Okay, go. So, so I think most people don't behave. I think 99% of people don't behave in their self-interest because, again, I have a more sophisticated view of what self-interest is. Self-interest is that which is rationally in your self-interest, mm. that which is rationally good for you in the long run. Mm. The cocaine snorter is not acting in his self-interest. Now, he might be acting in his emotional need right yeah, now. Satisfying the passion. He might be satisfying the passion. I believe a lot of people are miserable in their jobs. Yeah. Uh, I, believe a lot of, I believe a lot of teachers are teaching out of a sense of duty, not because they love teaching, and you can yeah. see it in the classroom. Yeah. All the unhappiness we see in the world, and unfortunately there's a lot of unhappiness, even among these bourgeoisie yeah. and middle yeah. class oh, people, yeah. it's because they haven't taken the time to think through what it means to be self-interested. So I tell audiences, to be selfish is hard work. <laughs> you literally have to think, what should I do? And how, is, how are the different options gonna affect my life over the next 40 years? Not just today, yeah. but over the next 40 years. And I have to resist temptations like the cocaine, let's say, or like uh, promiscuous sex or whatever, that, that might be pleasant, I mean, go to school, sure. but are gonna destroy my life long term. So it's, it's hard, it's complicated, it requires real effort, it requires engagement. So while people are constantly in a superficial way pursuing what they think will give them pleasure in the moment or, or yeah. some kind of satisfaction. Yeah, I, I should have said immediate selfishness. Yes, Sorry. but, but and yeah. even there it's not always the case because again, people go to work in jobs they hate, people do drudgery yeah, when they, they don't they like They need to get paid so they can pay their rent. Well, but also, but, they don't, but what about the options? There are other options. I mean, you discovered a wonderful yeah. option. They're, they're, yeah. There are many, many options in life, but so few people engage in the effort to figure out yeah. how to change their lives if they're living a miserable life. Mm -hmm. So many people just accept and go with the flow. Again, they're driven by emotion rather than by engaging with the world. Life is to be actively lived, which means you have to be an active thinker. Mm -hmm to really live life. And to me, the only people who are self-interested mm -hmm. are the people who are actively engaged in living their lives and thinking and reading and, and, and at whatever level you can do it, right? You can be a, you can be a, 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 a very low-skilled worker, sure. but still be engaged in what your activity is and figuring out the best way to do it and figuring out is, can I do more? Can I advance in life? That's what living life is. And, and it, to me, it's sad that almost nobody is self-interested. Because my goal in life is to get people to appreciate their life. <laughs> this should be easy. I don't know why it's so hard. I tell you, I think, I think the biggest barrier that objectivism has with like, the, the mass of people is the terminology. Because I tell you, you using the term selfishness and self-interest, that I, I can't imagine that you're going to get people to... Because uh, you, you've got a slightly different definition than most people use, sure. which is fine. You know, there's nothing, nothing wrong with you know, having a, a more precise definition or something like that. But it... it it needs a it needs a better word. The branding yeah, needs to be better. You see, this <laughs> in the sense in which that's right, but in a sense, there's like I, 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 I why should the other side get away with I, it? Right? I, so think I about so if you open up a dictionary definition yeah. of selfish, yeah. it'll say something like taking care of self, comma at the expense of others, yeah, or placing one's own well-being as the as the as one's primary concern, comma at the expense of others. And I'm going, why? Right? <laughs> what is this added on to the sentence? What the hell, who put that on there? And it's all those altruistic philosophers. It's the, it's the, it's the <laughs> Kantians, the Marxists, the Platonists. Mm. Add that on in order to make something that should be natural, unthinkable, mm. right? It should be natural, yeah. Placing your own well-being as your primary concern. Yeah, of course, why not? It has to be. And it has to be, <laughs> period. After that, and if that was the working definition of selfishness, then, it, then you ask the question, well, how do I place my own well-being as my primary concern? And then I would say, by using your mind, by using reason, by really thinking through, by applying yourself, 
and then it's easy. But once they add that and everybody's accepted it and it's ingrained in the culture, then I not only have to teach people how to, how to live for themselves, I have to teach them why they don't have to exploit other people or why they have to, why living for yourself doesn't entail exploiting other people. Indeed, exploiting other people is bad for you. Mm. It's not good for your and psyche. It's really interesting as well. Like, um, it, like <clears throat> I, you know, like I take my YouTube, sorry. Uh, no, I, have we got some time? We're, we're okay, okay. Yeah, but yeah, I have to monitor it, so. Sure, sure. Um, We've got another so 10, 15 like, minutes. I, I was thinking about this, like, <clears throat> Taking my YouTube channel as an example, I, I put up a video and I, I, I've got the self interest, I want people to see yeah, it. Because yeah, yeah. that, that, that's important. Yeah. And I'm, I know I'm not going to get any direct money from anyone for it, but I also know that there are people who will see that and appreciate what I've done and want to support what I'm doing and then will, after the fact, give me money. Yeah. And it's just like, I mean, like that, you know, I'm operating my own self interest. But what, you know, they're operating in their own self-interest as well because they want more of the same. You know, they, yeah. all, they want the next thing. But it, you know, none of it was compelled. None of it was exploitative. None of it was the expense of anyone else. Yeah. But it was all operating within everyone's self-interest, and everyone benefited, and everyone's happy with the relationship. Well, and, and, and to some extent, <clears throat> you know, you might even have some free riders. But, but you know what? So what? Yeah. Well, if like, they, because, I, get, I get off a side all the time. People even say, you know, I, "Can I help you? I don't want to be paid." Yes. No, but there are also people who are watching your show and not contributing. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, fine. Yeah, but but you're willing to have free riders. Uh, yeah, I want them to because there are enough people who are good people who are mm -hmm. who are, and they're doing it not because, not because they value you more than they value themselves. They do it because they value themselves. They're giving money to your channel. They don't have to. They can still watch your videos even if they don't give the money. Yeah. But good people, rational people, self-interested people want to pay for what they get. They want yeah. value for value. They don't want to be free riders. They don't want to leech off the system. So if they watch one of your videos and they've enjoyed the video, they want to give something in return. They want and they want to make sure that they're going to be videos in the in the future. Yeah. And they don't they want to just rely on other people contributing. Sure. They want to be part of it. So it, we need to really reframe what self-interest means. Mm. And and it, because I think it's too good of a term to give up. I'm not willing to say. Yeah, I'm not willing to say because the altruists have destroyed this term, you know, and they've also yeah. couched altruism as <laughs> altruism means being polite and nice to people and opening doors. Give me a break. It's, 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 it, that has nothing to do with what the term altruism actually yeah. means. Yeah, I don't, I don't consider that altruistic at all. That's just polite. Yes, that's, <laughs> anybody would do yeah. that, yeah. But and, and one thing I find really interesting is that it's like collectivism is inherently disempowering. You know, yes. you, you have to obey other people. You have yes. to obey a group. Well, you've you've got to give up something of yourself. That's inherently disempowering. And I, what what's really interesting is like the I, I guess we'll call it like the crowdfund economy. You know, and that's a really empowering thing because people will step up if they think it's something worth stepping up for. Yes. And it's 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 you know you can see people making things happen and that. <laughs> It, it brings people together. It's like, and nobody had to be coerced into it. No, nobody mean, had to be pressured into it. It's just like, hey, like the Mythicist was a great example, right? They, the Mythicist Milwaukee, I went to speak at this conference, yeah. and because of the SJWs complaining that they don't like me, um, they had to hire extra security, which yep. left them in a deficit. Oh. And so they thought, well, what we'll do is we'll, we'll put um, the conference up on the internet for like $3 a pop, yeah, yeah. and hopefully people will buy it. Yeah. But people are kind of, well, I don't know whether I'm going to get value yeah. for money. And so, they, yeah. and, and so I suggested them, look, why don't I put up the debate I was in on my channel, yeah. and then leave a link to a GoFundMe that you're yeah. doing, and then if people like it, they can they can help you. They got they were funded within a day. Yeah, you know they didn't get yeah. they, they got like seven hundred exactly, and it's great. and it just shows the, the the innate goodness within people as long as you trust them. Yeah, I mean because what you're doing is you're saying, look, I'm trusting you to help us. Here's what we have. Yeah. If you want to help, here's the change jar. And, and again, you're appealing to their self interest. Yeah. You're saying, here's a value I provided, yeah. and I'm asking for you to compensate me yeah. in return, it, and that works. It, it, it works beautifully. It's so much more productive. Yeah. It, people yeah. do it. But you see, people don't want to be self-empowered, and that's why they appeal to collectivism. Collectivism, the beauty of collectivism, mm -hmm. is it allows you not to take responsibility for your life. Ah, that's and, 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 and if you don't take responsibility for your life, then you're now shielded from the consequences of what happens in the world by this group yeah. and by the welfare system and by checks coming in or whatever, and you don't have to actually be the person who's active yeah. and engaged and you might fail, yep. and it's and you're afraid, and you actually have to think. And as I said, being self-interested is hard work, and you you, you might be lazy. Mm -hmm. So it's it's for being who is trained to be emotion emotional. Mm -hmm. Crowds are safety. Yes. So collectivism is emotionalism. Reason leads to individualism. Mm 
emotionalism leads to collectivism. If, 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 if Plato has told you your mind is, is incapable of knowing reality, then how do you know the truth? Well, you look to other people. Why would I trust his opinion if minds are so faulty? Well, you don't, <laughs> but, but, but hopefully you hope yeah. that it really it's comfort, right? Yeah. You, you, you imagine living, in a, and it's hard to imagine because I don't think either of us have ever experienced this. Imagine living in a, in a condition where you're afraid of the world, you don't know what's true, what's not. Mm -hmm. you, you, you've, been, you've been encouraged not to believe your senses and not to believe your mind. And you're kind of wandering in this world. You, you, a group you is a comfort. You need a group. You, you need, need a group. It's, it's, a, it's like you've been brought to the level of an animal. Yeah. And animal need, animals, almost all animals, there are a few exceptions, need packs. Mm -hmm. They need the, 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 the group. They can't function by themselves yeah. because they can't deal with the changing world out there. So they need that group. And human beings, when they are driven to the level of an animal, a non-human animal, because we're yeah. animals too, they become packs. And, and this is why you get the, and, and, and think about it. Primitive man, before we developed the conceptual faculty, lived in tribes. Sure. And, and, and they felt comfortable in tribes because they, and, 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 because they hadn't fully, it's not that they weren't capable of the conceptual faculty, but being conceptual, being a thinker is an achievement. Yeah. And it, it, took, it took human beings, you know, thousands of years to become thinkers. And to some extent, we're still in the process of becoming thinkers. And I don't think human society is quite ready fully to become thinkers. And this is why it's so hard. This mm. is why what we're trying to do is so hard because people... People, it's easier to be emotional, and it's easier to be lazy conceptually, and therefore it's much easier to be a collectivist. I think it's really interesting how um, collectivism is a diffusion of responsibility as well. Yes. You know, it, and that's a very interesting thing. It's almost like... Um, it's safer. Yeah, it's safety in numbers, right. isn't it? I, I, I didn't do that. Yeah, I exactly. didn't build that. Yeah, I, I didn't create that. And if it falls down, it wasn't my fault. Yeah, there are ten right. of you there. Who's yeah. going to get the blame? Yeah, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's it's yeah. very safe. And again, for a snowflake, for anybody who's emotionally fragile, mm -hmm. for anybody who doesn't really trust their mind, they don't want failure. See, I don't mind failure mm -hmm. because I know I can learn from failure. I know that every failure is an opportunity for me to grow in some way mm -hmm. because I have confidence in my own ability to think and to, to exist in the world. Steve Jobs didn't mind. I mean. Obviously, he was depressed when he failed, but at the end of the day, he learned from failure and got back on his field, and he, he didn't mind it in that sense. It didn't crush him. It didn't yeah. destroy him. There's so many people out there because they don't, going back to one of Iron Man's values, they don't have self-esteem. Yes. Because they don't have self-esteem, and the reason they don't have self-esteem is because they haven't really practiced really being rational consistently. Any failure crushes them. Mm -hmm. So it's much easier to absolve responsibility, to, to give it to the group, to, to, to diffuse responsibility. Yeah. Then, then they personally can't fail. Yes, and then Obama comes and tells the people who have succeeded, you didn't build that. And it makes us all feel really good because if they didn't build that, then I shouldn't be blamed for the fact that I haven't built anything in life. Yeah. And it just appeals to the <laughs> lowest common denominator. Yeah, suddenly you're not a loser. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. that's, that's right, because it's all accident, that. right? Yeah. And, and of course we have whole philosophies now. Uh, like John Rawls, who whole philosophies that basically <clears throat> tell you, you know, and, and unfortunately a lot of good people buy into this determinism in a sense, right? What you are is a consequence of your genes and your environment. So it doesn't matter. So you, you get no more credit, you get no more blame because you're just an automaton determined by your parents and by your genes. And, and, and just go for it. It, it boggles yeah. my mind that people think this. It saps out any any accomplishment from the individual. I mean, like, yeah. you, know, you sat down, okay, you, <clears throat> you know, you were born with these genes in this time and this place, but you could have squandered that. Yes, or any blame or, or, yeah. or any, any responsibility for anything you do. It's just, and of course, my view is that, yeah, there's a genetic influence, there's no question. Yeah, there's an environmental influence, there's no question. But the thing that really makes your life is the choices you make. This is why reason is so important, because you want to make good choices, because you want to live a good life. Mm -hmm. if, if we're deterministic, who cares about reason? Who cares about anything? Why should I, why should I think? Why should I make an effort? Why should I? Because it, it, what's, you know, what's going to happen is going to happen, kind of the fatalism that is so common out there. Mm -hmm. But no, your choices matter. They matter to your life. So no matter what your genes are, no matter what your environment, at the end of the day, you're going to shape your own life. Yeah. And, and that's a message, again, that's hard for people to hear because if they hear that, they go, if I didn't build it, it's my fault.
It is. Yeah, absolutely. It You've is. got no one else to blame. Yeah. You know, oh, but oh, no, yeah. it's, it's the... the well, it's my jeans. Yeah, it's the capitalist it's keeping me down or, you know... It's my like father that, you know. locked me in the closet when yeah, I was three. And I, I tell you that, I, I can't stand when people... And this is, what, this is what I hate fundamentally about the communists and the old right and the Nazis and that. Yeah. You know, it's always someone else's fault. Yes. It's always yes. someone else's fault that you aren't... I don't know, you're not, you're not doing whatever it is you think you're yes. doing. It's like, no. It's not. It's your fault. Absolutely. You're an actor, you're an agent, you're intelligent, you have reason, and you failed. Why have you failed? Take some responsibility. Yes. I mean, there are circumstances, granted, sure. in the war okay. that, yeah. that might make it difficult. Suddenly, sure. if, you're, if, you, if you're trying to make a living and the government is regulating, controlling everything, suddenly yeah. some of the blame is theirs. But even in the controlled, regulated world we live in, there are immense opportunities. Yeah, we're, immense opportunities. We're more free than not, I think. Yes. I, I still think that's true. Yeah. Although it's. <laughs> well, I, I wonder sometimes, we, some days. Corbyn depends, might, partially also depends what industry you're in. Yeah. Um, Corbyn might win, we never know. <laughs> yes, and, and Corbyn might make it a lot worse. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and. and uh, but, but it's true. I mean, I always say, you know, the, the, the Trump voters, you know, a lot of these <laughs> frustrated middle class uh, uh, people who are upset because they don't have job opportunities and they, they you know, and they want their steel job back. And, you know, get in your car and go find a job. There are plenty of jobs in America. I mean, I go through, whole, I, I travel a lot. So I see whole states where there are cranes and there's development and there's jobs and, yeah. and, and the shorter New people. New York, I was just there. And then you go to, yeah, if you go to Southern Ohio, it's rough. Yeah. So get in your car and drive to Northwest Arkansas where they're building like crazy. They are, you know, take respons again, take responsibility over your own life. Become an entrepreneur, build something. Yes. You know, that, I mean, yes. if there are people well, there. Well, granted, not around. everybody's going to be an entrepreneur. Sure. Fine. But, but the point is, whatever it is, take responsibility for your own yeah. life. Don't expect people to hand it to you. Don't expect things to just show up at your doorstep. And this is what America used to be. Mm -hmm. America used to be the land of opportunity. You came and you went and found your opportunity. If you had to cross the entire country, it, on a wagon yeah, yeah. to get somewhere you did and today you've got automobiles and airplanes that are really cheap and we still and we're not willing to exert the effort to go to where the jobs and opportunities are that I don't feel sorry for you and 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 for most of steelworkers the fact is that they lost their jobs to technology mm -hmm. and they're never coming back so 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 get a grip yeah I, I'm, I, I'm a little more sympathetic than that uh, but I, I mean I can understand that if you're you know you're you're a poor guy who lives in the Rust Belt you've you, you maybe you don't have much money. Maybe you can't really afford a car. I don't know. You know, I. But you've got to accept. Almost all that, poor Americans have cars. Uh, sure, they probably do. But um, but you've got to accept that things have changed and they're not going to just change back. You know? Things have changed and they're not going to change back. The question back. is, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. And and this is the difference in mentality. In things always change. Yeah. Things since the birth of the industrial revolution, things have changed constantly. Generally, life has gotten better, but there have been periods where, for particular people, life has gotten worse. Yeah. Coal mines closed, gold mines closed, and people, when that happens, have traditionally gotten up and moved to where the opportunities existed. And what we're seeing today, and there was there have been a number of articles actually demonstrating numerically that this is the case. What we're seeing today in America for the first time is that people are staying put, mm -hmm. that they might be losing their jobs, there might be no opportunities in their vicinity, and they're staying put. And this has to do with the self-responsibility. Now, granted, even here the government plays a role because welfare programs, Medicare, Medicaid, all these other programs are often locally determined. And by moving, you might right. lose your benefits. So there are all kinds so of ways in which they're incentivized <laughs> to stay put. And I would still say, you know, come on people, you know, it's, you've only got one life to live. <coughs> you know, and go out there and find a way to live it the best that you can. Don't just sit on your butt. At the end of the day, what are you risking anyway? If you're complaining yes. that you're at the bottom of the barrel, you've got no opportunities, you're poor. Yes. Well, then you need to move. Yes. I mean, what do you, you know? What well, you I think, I think, I think the biggest tragedy for poor people has been the welfare state. I, I, I think what the welfare state does to their self-esteem, yeah. it, it basically says to them, we as a society have acknowledged that you are incapable of taking care of yourself. And therefore, we're going to supply you with checks on a regular basis, no matter what you do. So don't worry, be poor. And and we're sending them the exact wrong message. And in, 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 for example, levels of poverty among blacks in America were dramatically declining until the war on poverty began. And and I think we took away the incentive. But more important than just the momentary incentive, we took away the the kind of self esteem the kind of idea that being productive, having a job, working, taking care of myself is important. We've said that's not important. The government can take care of you, don't worry about it. 
Yeah, no, that, that, I do think that's a genuinely important thing as well. People's self-esteem is something that's very rarely, uh, like, even considered. Yes. Like, they, you know, I, I mean, yes. But it's the most <coughs> important thing in life, I think. I think you yeah. can be happy unless you have self-esteem. And I say this, if you don't work for a living, in other words, if you don't produce to bring bread to the table to feed yourself and your family, you will never have self-esteem. Self-esteem does not come from getting ribbons, it does not come from people patting you on the back. It comes from achieving something and taking care of yourself in this world. Saying to yourself in a sense, yeah, I can survive. I, I, I'm not dependent on other people. What the welfare state does is it wipes that up and says, yes, you are dependent on other people and we're going to keep you dependent on other people. And, and if you buy into that, which unfortunately is very easy to do, particularly when you're young, then you're never going to have self-esteem. You're never going to have a job. Having work is probably the most important thing people could have to develop self-esteem. Yeah, I mean, uh, overcoming and succeeding despite yes. the odds yes. is, is the, the building box of self-esteem. Yes. Like it's that. achievement. And the yeah. fact is that we, we, we achievement is, a prim, is like activity to the primarily do at work. Mm. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right, um, I guess we'll uh, we'll wrap it up there. Sounds good. So, honestly, Excellent. thank you so yeah, much. This was brilliant. Really Thanks. Fascinating conversation. Thanks. Good. Great. I hope it's recorded. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. <laughs>